time, primarily because the discussions have been so interesting. So thank you all for bearing with us. We have um, an extremely interesting session this afternoon, I think. This section, this session really, uh, to my mind, is particularly interesting because it brings together several aspects of challenge that we have had around the game. So this does uh, make it a little simpler for me. Thank you. So the idea, really, of this colloquium uh, was to honor um, to honor Mr. Oberwald and uh, his uh, his dedication to the cause of the Ganges of the Ganga. Um, from from a perf from a, a water management perspective, though. It really also integrates, uh, I think, two strands of particularly interesting river and the complexities of trying to manage a river that is so large, so diverse in its uses, so culturally important, and yet caught in arguably, and it sounds like a pun, I hadn't intended this, but it's the mainstream of the Indian economy as well. How do you, how do you balance all of that and, and really protect the health of the river? The other aspect that is folded into this afternoon's colloquium, which I think is fascinating, is the Ganges water machine, which is a, a, a phenomenon that I had been reading up on years ago as well. And I think you can't help but hear it almost as an H.G. Wells, almost a sci-fi construct of this Ganges water machine, this massive system that can regenerate if we use it properly. And that's just also just a fascinating construct, the machine. So I'm particularly interested to hear the presentations this afternoon, really to think the latest, to, to hear the latest thinking around the challenge of keeping the river or creating the river that India aspires to with the Ganges, and to try to find some of the science, uh, almost, almost toward the science fiction of these larger ways in which we can manage the system um, and make it healthy and thriving and help it uh, continue to be a driver of, of growth um, and a mainstay of spirituality in the, in the country as well. So this afternoon we have uh, five presentations. We begin with um, a keynote by Tusha. I hope his voice will hold <laughs> because this is particularly important um, as, it, as it, is, it is also a tribute to this colloquium. Um, and we then have another series of, of four very interesting presentations. I won't waste time now introducing them because I will introduce them as we go through. And we, we will try to end about on time because it's been a long day, but again, rich discussions. So with no further ado, I will hand directly over to Tisha. Oh. Stretch of conscious is basically between Kanpur and Varanasi. <laughs> and the burden of our argument is that the <coughs> rethinking irrigation uh, offers a possible solution to this. Many points are Namami Gange has two components, Nirmadara, which is unpolluted flow. And Avidadara, which is uninterrupted flow. But making Nirmadara is far more difficult than making Avidadara. That is my proposition here. Yeah. Because Nirmadara involves changing mindsets, changing large behavior of large numbers of people, which is not going to happen over time. It's something that we must do, and we will have to do that. But I don't think it's going to happen by 2020, which is the target by which you want to see Ganga better. But it's possible to improve the rises and flows of Ganga in quick time if only we are willing to do some open thinking about how we irrigate. The main problem is in the upper Ganga basin, where a large volume of diversion canal, Ganga water, is diverted for irrigation and not increasingly also for hydropower. But basically, all that well water, even the hydropower water, ends up in the canals. Nothing goes, nothing comes back to the, to the river. The real question is, what is the social economic value 
of canonization today. Because the UP government, uh, the CWC, everybody has been arguing that the agricultural economy of the upper Kinka Basin depends critically on canal irrigation. And that is something, there is no evidence in support of that, that uh, contention. And that is something that I think needs to be questioned. Or at least needs to be interrogated. UGC is one of the worst, most densely plumbed regions for groundwater irrigation. The density of tube wells per 100 hectares and the density of horsepower pumping capacity per 100, per 100 horsepower is the highest in India and probably the highest anywhere in the world. Ganja's water machine, which was once a concept, is actually a reality. It's operating full blast, it's alive and kicking. And it's also irreversible. irreversible. If you look at the kind of returns that farmers are getting from tubal irrigation and compare that with canal irrigation, it's, it's hard to imagine that farmers will ever want to go back to canal irrigation and give up all the flexibility that uh, tubal irrigation is offering them. The Chitty Agarwal's demand that Ganga's monthly flows be restored to 50% of its natural flow is achievable quickly and at negligible cost to Upper Ganga Basin's agricultural economy. These are hypotheses. It needs to be tested further. We need to dig, dig, dig deeper and look at all, all aspects of the I just want to present one set of data sets that never seem to enter the debate on Namami Gandhi as well as on how the Ganga waters are used. So actually, when Ganga comes to Hardwar, it is something like 30, 31,000 few sets of flow. Hardwar is the first major diversion, about 10,000 few sets or more actually. And then the flow begins to decline. In Bajnor, there are another set of diversions and the flow declines even further. By the time the river comes to Narora, there is again about 13,000 two sets of flow still left. But after that, by the time the river comes to Kanpur, the flow decreases to just about 2,000 two sets. And then we have this dirty stretch where you have very high pollution load and also very low flow in the river. Now, the bulk of the water that is being diluted in Upper Ganga Basin has created in the past a very prosperous region, which is basically the sugar belt of Western UP, which has about 11, 11 districts, which have very really high density of sugar, sugar cane cultivation. Now, this has been going on for 130, 140 years. When the Upper Ganga Canal was first constructed by Prudy At that time, the colonial government's idea was not so much to protect food security, but to increase the cultivation of opium, indigo, uh, sugar cane, and certain the commercial crops, which had large export demand. So that is what this region became about 100, 150 years ago. But the Ganga Basin farmers have been rapidly taken to tubal irrigation since 1970. And there are databases that show this, which I have not seen being discussed in the discussion on Namami Gandhi. Now, I think that there are two different irrigation models that are working simultaneously in the Ganga Basin. There was this canal irrigation model originally promulgated by Prabhu Kotli, that there are large waters available which can be diverted through canals and they can be taken to areas which are propitious for high value crops and then therefore you can create a large cash, cash crop economy. So, <clears throat> diversion of canal labor, I think after independence, the government of India has continued building these canal networks with double, uh, double uh, force. The British systematically tried to dismantle well irrigation. Many of the shallow wells came, went down on their own as the water table started going up. But even the messenger wells were dismantled. Why? Because the colonial government saw all canal irrigation systems as commercial enterprises. And the engineers and the people down to the village level were under, were under such great pressure to generate revenue, to raise revenue as better men really, and water charges because that was the ultimate litmus test of the viability of the canal irrigation system. And the process, they dismantled alpine systems, they dismantled wells, 
the discouraged all traditional forms of irrigation. So that farmers' dependence on canal irrigation is total. Actually, we have forgotten, but until 30, 40 years ago, this created what a British engineer called a howling wilderness bereft of crops or vegetation. Through what the missing bed, water tables came up so high in many of the regions that ulcer and rain became massive problems. There was a time when four and four and a half million hectares of land in um, the Ganga Basin were suffering from very high levels of alkalinity and soil salinity. And the productivity of that land went down. There was much larger area suffering from water logging, where productivity per hectare loss went down in terms of food coming. At the same time, you also have this other model that is working, which is totally farm driven, flood minimizing irrigation. It's basically pump recharge deplete pump system, in which pump uh, deplete and pump works very well, but recharge doesn't seem to work as well. So there's this PRDB protocol, which has become the dominant irrigation uh, model of uh, Ganga Basin. If you pump ground water in the western side during dry season to create something like 60 billion cubic meters of subsurface storage, then in a flat basin where you hardly any sites for building dams, you can actually create storage during dry season, which can be filled up during monsoon by recharge. And then you keep pumping that water during dry season again. So you are able to create an equilibrium in surface ground water irrigation um, uh, protocol which reduces the intensity of floods in Bihar and in eastern parts of the basin. So if this had worked as it was originally envisaged, the intensive groundwater irrigation in western and central part and flood control would have occurred in the east. What has actually happened is that replenishing the storage during monsoon so floods through distributed uh, managed aquifer recharge has not really worked as well as it should have. And therefore, we have Ganga losing flow to the groundwater because there's a big, very interesting presentation by Professor Mukherjee which shows how Ganga loses flow both to canal diversions as well as to groundwater depletion. So there's a double whammy for, uh, for Ganga flows at, at present. Now I will show these data sets which show that the, that the Ganga is in agriculture's dependence on tuber has increased massively. These are three NSSO surveys in uh, uh, it's a whole India surveys. We have taken out the data for the four Ganga Basin states and we have very significant uh, sample sizes, you know, more than 3,000. And this show, this show that <coughs> between the NSSO round of 1982 and the NSSO round of 2012-13, the irrigation coverage in the basin has increased from nearly 60% to 84%. And the bulk of the contribution has come from tubers. The area served by canals has decreased from 30% to 13%. So this is one set of data. There was another survey that was done by the University of Columbia and NCER in 2012. Again, a large-scale survey. It was a human development survey. that had nothing to do with irrigation. But they asked lots of questions about how rural livelihoods were. One of the questions they ask is that what is the most important source of irrigation? Mm -hmm. So we have taken out the data for Ganga Basin and compared them with the rest of India. And this, this chart shows that. So for Ganga Basin, we have a sample of 3,500 households. For the rest of India, we have a sample of 12,400 households. This again shows that Ganga Basin's dependence on tubers is way higher than the rest of India. 80, 82% of the households saying that tube, private tube was the most important irrigation source, MIIS, in Ganga Basin. Only 37.8% of the households in the rest of India said, said so. So Ganga Basin is way more dependent on shallow tube beds than the rest of, the rest of India for irrigation. One of the major characteristics of Ganga Basin is that groundwater markets are far more intensive in Ganga Basin than elsewhere in India. Far more buyers, far more tuber owners and non tuber owners depend on buying tuber irrigation service from tuber owners who maintain the irrigation more demands compared to the rest of the country. So in Ganga
Sri Lanka facing which is on the left, 98, 92% of those who don't own two pets and 44% of those who own two pets. They all buy one. It's basically in the typical village. The, like we saw in Dodi and Atlam yesterday, basically a few people own two pets and the rest of the village depends on them for buying irrigation service. In the rest of India, the dependence on water markets is much less than mm. in, uh, in Gangavis. This is a minor irrigation census which goes to every village and counts, takes a head count of the two beds, asks each farmer about the other two beds. And this map reports that it shows the number. Each dot on this map shows 5,000 two beds. So Gangavis already had a high density of two beds. This was 1987, and this is 2012-13. Now, there's an explosive growth in the density of private two beds in Gangabi, in Gangabisi. If you see in the lower map, you know, it shows the entire, the entire bed. It's virtually kind of black, it shows a very high number of presence of, uh, of two beds for irrigation. This is the density of two beds, the density of Pumping capacity, one and a half, one point five to two horsepower per hectare is the is the pumping capacity that they have. And if you see the upper Ganga basin, is completely maroon. It is very high pumping capacity. This is LUS data. Uttar Pradesh percentage of red area served by canals and by tubes. Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India. The net area served by canals is shifting from west to east. This was the picture in 1970. And most of the canal irrigation was in the Upper Ganga Basin. And in Upper Ganga. And in 2011, the Upper Ganga Basin is becoming more and more white and eastern parts of the basin are becoming more blue. The net area served by two beds is booming in UGC command. They were important but not so important during 1970. But 2011, the entire of Ganga Basin has the highest you know, triple irrigation. Hmm. This is the government of India's ninth agricultural census. Now these are different agencies collecting different sets of data independently. And all of them show that upper Ganga Basin, when 97% of the area is supposed to be covered by government canals, the actual irrigation is done by two beds. Census schedule of 2011 program, there is a village survey separate, and there they go ask the village official or the village leader is your village a part of a major or medium irrigation system? And if so, what is the claim of that system? Now, this map shows the percentage of villages which say that they are part of a major or medium irrigation. On the red area, shows that 5% of the villages say that they, had, they were part of a major remedial irrigation system and could claim that system. The entire upper Ganga Basin, less than 5% of the village heads say that they are part of a major remedial irrigation system. Or the area, it is known that nobody else is saying that there is no measurement error. If there were a large measurement error, then in Punjab also you will find the same thing. But if you see in the lower map, Punjab, farmers are saying that they are member of the community. Andhra Pradesh, yes, they say, South Gujarat, which we know is an irrigated area, their village leaders are able to identify the major or medium irrigation system that they are part of. But India, Pagangla Basin, they are just not able to, able to identify. They are not even saying that they are part of a major or medium irrigation system. So, what precisely is happening? I mean, a region which is seen that would require receive massive investments for 170, 180 years on canal irrigation. Why is that canal, that canal irrigation is not showing any impact? The red areas show areas which have high concentration of electric turbines. So you can see that there are parts of Upper Ganga Basin where the electric pumps, density of electric pumps is higher, and electric pumps have enjoy lower cost of pumping, and therefore for sugarcane economy, irrigation, electric turbines are particularly beneficial. These are also the pockets where you see groundwater depletion. 
this is the CGWB's map of groundwater depleted areas. And Eastern Ganga has hardly any groundwater. Eastern Beijing has any groundwater depletion. But it is here that we see pockets of groundwater depletion. The area which has the highest density of canals and highest density of tube beds is also showing very high level of groundwater, groundwater depletion. We try to see what exactly is the economic role of canal irrigation. So we estimated a very simple OLS recursive model in which tube irrigated area, rain fed hectare, and canal irrigated hectare informs the value of output, agriculture output to this five intermediate variables. And the estimates that we got are this. That if you add a rain fed of hectare, a rain fed hectare to a district, then it adds 59,000 rupees to the gross value of crop and milk output. If you add a canal irrigated hectare, it adds 137,000 rupees of gross value of crop and milk output. This is not net income. This is a gross value of output. Because that's what one would be a bit. But if you add a tube irrigated, a tube, not a tube irrigated hectare, just a tube, then the gross value of milk and crop output becomes by 300. 335,000 rupees. Now we will look at these numbers and it's realized that why would farmer not give up a tubal for canal irrigation? Because a tubal adds so much to this and a tubal can easily get two, two and a half hectares. Which basically means that the net value added by a tubal is probably way higher than what the number that I indicated, indicated here. And it is for this reason that the, that the tubal revolution is irreversible. There is no price at which farmers would give up tubal irrigation go back to the canal irrigation. So then the real question is that what exactly is all the canal water? 80% of the gas flows are diverted in the upper Ganga basin to canal irrigation. There are hardly any dry water, dry flows and flows are left. What exactly is all this? This this doing exposing some it's washing down in the basin. We don't have a clear answer to that. But I think what has happened is that until 1947, when canal irrigation was commercially viable, the pressure on the engineers to make sure that they can collect better and living irrigation service charge, make sure the network of canal distributary is minor, we decided to take the regional bank maintain. You cannot collect, you know, they collect, started collecting um, irrigation service charge without providing irrigation. The farmers would have gone to courts. There are lots of such court cases in the 1930s in Punjab. The farmers took the government to the court that you can take your collecting irrigation service charge without providing a irrigation. So I think that pressure made sure that the canal network was maintained very well. By 1960, irrigation service charges had stopped being collected. And therefore, the pressure on the irrigation department to keep the upkeep of the canal system had deteriorated. I think in the last 40, 45 years, there has been no investment in maintenance of the canal system. Most of the canals are urgent. There was an FAO, uh, FAO workshop with 40 canal irrigation engineers in the Upper Ganga Basin in 2008. And that report is available on the internet. It's very instructive. That report says that there's absolutely no water control below the distributary. Which basically means that water goes from the main canal up to the distributary. On from there, it just goes around the road wherever it wants to go. Those are the areas which, which are like the Okai system in South Uda. The farmers want to get out of sugar cane cultivation, but they can't because there's so much water that no other crop can use that much water. So sugar cane and rice are the only crop that farmers can grow in certain parts. Of it. Something similar is happening in the upper Ganga Canal. The farmers cannot get out of sugar cane and take the crops like pretty cotton. That's because there's so much of canal water sloshing around. Yeah. So I think there are pockets of very large recharge mounds near around the distributaries. This is a hypothesis around the distributors below which there is no water control. And below that, I don't think much water goes into miners and sub-miners in the future. So this is probably what is happening. It is something that needs to be investigated. But the point is that if 80% of the canal water is really getting just 10% of the Nitsun area, then why can't we take half that water and put it back into the river? Or why can't we stop prices and flows? Okay, why can't we just keep rice and flows at least to 50%? 50 so, this is the, the FAO workshop 
there's a sum to be through that. It's massive. They are waiting. It's 160 years old canal paper. There is no water control below the distribution river. The input water, canal irrigation, canal water, I three and four, is somewhere like 25,000 cubic meters per hectare. I mean, it's a lesser of command area. They literally allowed this 2,000 cubic meters per hectare. Here in Uttar, Uttar uh, Upper Ganga Basin, the water available in the Upper Ganga Basin is 25,000 meters per cubic meters. Per, uh, per hectare. Canal water productivity is very low. That is what the workshop itself noticed. Farmers and little canal deliveries in minor and some minor levels. So you see, let's see my concrete lining in some of the canals is actually impeding recharge and root these canals. There's large non beneficial evaporation and evapotranspiration occurring. So basically, the economic significance of canal irrigation to upper Ganga region's agriculture. I think it needs to be properly assessed. I showed that there is a lot of evidence from databases which are commonly not used by hydrogeologists, hydro which shows that the irrigation pattern in the region has changed. But I've been able to find nothing to support the contention that the agricultural economy of upper Ganga region is critically dependent on surface water deliveries. There is no study. It's just a plain assertion without any, any empirical support. So reallocating the water from canal diversion to environmental flows in the river has little or marginal economic cost and very large environmental and cultural benefit. Instead of building more diversion canals, as we still keep, still keep it, there are still plans to build more canals. We need to focus on sustaining the largest water machine. And for this, what is needed a low cost intervention for augmented distributed recharge with monsoon runoff to make a PRDPE protocol sustainable. And Amy has done a lot of work, actually, in the 1980s. Amy worked with the Depart irrigation department and Barney in UP to, to divert monsoon flood flows into old drains that were in disuse. This very small amount of money was spent on building small check dams on those drains. And the results have been documented. The Amy, Amy got a highlight number one reports results on, on that. And the results are extraordinary. I mean, the increase in the number of flood flows to improve recharge. I think there are low cost techniques which can increase the resolve the groundwater depletion problems in the upper Ganga basin and make more and more some, uh, water available for increasing the drives and flows in Ganga. Ensuring that the dial can do more than half the job of Namami Gandhi, and it's something that can be done quickly and at a low cost. Thank you. Construction or and planned hydropower project, mainly mm -hmm. the riches of Ganga, up to the Kashmir. He also Not wanted the Kashmir. Dev Prayer. Dev Prayer. 
he also wanted uh, a ban on sand mining on the main channel of the river. And the fourth one was he wanted to form an autonomous body of people which would then look after the operations of managing the river. Thank you very much. I think I'm done. Uh, more or less. But I think in next presentations or deliberations, I'll be very happy if you sort of bring the references back to the demand that GD met. Uh, how plausible, implausible. Uh, he died for a, for a cause, a cause that he believed in. Uh, I'm not saying that the entire audience has to believe in that cause. But I think it's if we do justice to the man if we sort of bring our deliberations to the, to the cause he died for. So. Why? Farmers switch to boulders not because there is, not because there is a separate resource, but it's because it's a more conveniently uh, community of managing that resource. But if they are really getting canal water. If you cut off the canal water, they may not their tube will be run dry. The um, something the dynamics of that I think will probably be discussed in some of the other presentations as well. So we'll move on now to our presentation by Abhijit Mukherjee who will speak to us about groundwater depletion. Is it driving the desiccation of the Ganga? And uh, I do think that this will speak to the dynamics that you've just discussed. Is there a microphone there? Very good. So, Abhijit, welcome. You know, um, I'm really uh, thankful to Tushar and his team for inviting me out here uh, to present uh, one of our recent studies uh, on the groundwater depletion located you know, in the Ganges River Drive. Uh, before I start, I'd like to show my respect to uh, uh, related uh, Professor J.J. Agarwal, who kind of gave his life for the same topic. And it was just coincidental that, you know, our paper came out just a few days before, you know, he passed away. Um, okay, so what I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, from the morning I've been talking about more about the management side and the social aspect side. What I'm trying to bring in the table is the more physical science and the chemical science. You know, I'm a hydrogeologist by training. I teach hydrogeology and the groundwater dynamics at IIT Khayapur and uh, this, uh, this work that I'm presenting uh, is a combination of few of our work um, uh, in collaboration with my former student uh, Shomendra Ponja who is present in uh, Athabasca University in Canada, uh, my colleague Yoshihai Iwada at ISA, Matt Roden at NASA and Alan McDonald at the British Geological Survey. So, you know, me and my students went across, you know, the Ganges Plain, mostly in the uh, eastern part and the central part, uh, starting from Varanasi to uh, the Bay of Bengal. And uh, in the summers of 2015 to 2017, we have seen a profuse number of these incidents. Made us yet. So, you know, the question that came to our mind is very obvious. Is the Ganges on the heart of crime? Now, people think like this is just a you know, one year thing and, you know, one year the rainfall was low or whatever and possibly, you know, that's what's causing it. But when you see this recurrence, uh, the, the incidences on a more higher frequency, then as a physical scientist, I ought to think that there is something else that is happening. And that kind of, you know, uh, 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 kind of forced us to take out this study, which got published in the Nature Scientific Reports in August of 2018, uh, talking about groundwater depletion causing reduction of beach flow triggering Ganges River summer time. So before I go in, I'll just like to give, very briefly give you the principle of groundwater river water interactions. Now some of you might already be knowing about this, but I'll just still like to touch about it. So you know the groundwater and the river water are in continuum. So you know one is the reflection of the other, that kind of thing, and they do have lags. Uh, you know, like groundwater would go down sometime and river water would come up and sometime. So depending on that kind of uh, uh, architecture, you do have what you call a gaining stream and what you call a losing stream. And in a gaining stream, the groundwater is at a higher level uh, than the river water stage. Consequently, the groundwater would flow and kind of uh, uh, provide the water to the, uh, to the uh, river. Whereas in the, in the contrasting scenario, you have the river water at a higher elevation than the groundwater, so that the river water would actually be feeding the groundwater. Now, for our instance, the Ganges, and for all the Himalayan mega rivers, and also the southern rivers actually, we have a misconception that these rivers are glacial rivers. We do have glacial feet, but honestly, as I'll show you in the next few slides, a major portion of the river is actually sustained by groundwater. 
Most of these humans are what we call gaining skills. So they are survived by what we call the base flow. So our, our observation of this phenomena that I just explained in the last uh, two slides, uh, you know, kind of provide the indicators to look in a, a little more details on what's happening. Now, unfortunately enough, or maybe fortunately for the government, you know, the data is not in public domain. You cannot get Gandhi's water level data in the government. I'm, you know, I'm in the Ministry of Human Resources as a part of IT Kharagpur, but I don't even have the access to it. So what we have to do is, you know, go for proxies. And we, we, we took help of satellite ultimately and remote sensing data to, uh, to map out uh, the, the Ganges water volume uh, from Varanasi to the Bay of Bengal in the Indian side uh, uh, for the last, uh, you know, 12 years, from 2003 to 2015. And what we found out, you will see this, these red markers are kind of showing you, you know, the relative ground low from the, uh, from the animal average. So you will see there are a lot more reds in the more recent years than, you know, uh, than 2003. Which is telling you there's recurrence that the photograph I showed you is much more common in the more recent years. And it cannot be just a coincidence. So we thought like we'll try to figure out, like, as I said, like what is the component of groundwater that is feeding uh, or keeping the Ganges alive. So when we did uh, hydrogen chemical modeling and isotopic analysis of uh, the ground, the summer water of the Ganges um, in different parts of the river, but I'm just showing you the four uh, major stretches. So one in Varanasi, Park Bell, Faraka, and Kolkata, and you will see the groundwater component kind of varies from 23 to up to 40 percent, and sometimes it goes up to 60 percent actually. So the major part of, or, or a substantial part of the water that we're seeing in the Ganges is actually coming from the local groundwater. So we thought, uh, and again this was our ongoing project with NASA that we have been doing for the last few years, so we thought that we'll, we'll take uh, the help of uh, some of the satellite data that are available. So we, we, uh, uh, we took the help of the, uh, the GRIS satellite mission that NASA runs, and uh, my good friend Matt and uh, we decided to look at the long term um, you know, water level situation, groundwater level situation of the Indian subcontinent. And um, I'll briefly to talk about these two satellites. So these are called the Tom and Jerry, and one goes about 220 kilometers apart from the other. And what it does is it has a microsensor which, which uh, measures the gravity changes. And it goes along uh, on, the, on the earth surface uh, you know, several times a day. So what it does is any change in the gravity, it relates it to a change in the uh, water uh, storage. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the satellites were launched in 2002 and it's still working. Actually, this next, the next international satellites just went out late, early this year. So what we're going to do is, we're going to look at, um, sorry, uh, is uh, the, the groundwater scenario, the groundwater storage across the uh, Indian subcontinent um, in these uh, 15 or so years. So this work was eventually, uh, you know, like once when it got published in 2017, it became the NASA image of the day, so it was in their website for a while. Um, it's still there, I suppose. Uh, I'll, I'll possibly come back to this figure again, but just on a, you know, very briefly, I'll just uh, to show you two things. One is this brown thing out here, out here. This is where the groundwater is drastically falling. But more interesting, there will be other areas which are more greenish and bluish. These are the areas where we believe the groundwater is actually coming out, like the storage is replenishing. So, you know, as, as it says, India's groundwater again, that was the title of the website. So this is the typical scale groundwater storage change over the Indian subcontinent from 2003 to 2014. We now also have to 2016. And you can, you know, see like, you know, every year there is a change in color of any specific place. And the color kind of shows you either the gain or the loss of groundwater storage in that one pixel. So blue or uh, more violet would be higher storage than average, but as red would be lower storage. So if you have more blue, that means that the water storage is coming up, whereas the red would show that the water storage is going down. So the, the thing that I would like to highlight here is that if you see the, the northern Indian plain, uh, which was pretty violet and then became blue and then slowly it became red, also suggesting that the groundwater storage in this area is actually depleted. I'm, I'm sorry to differ from uh, you know, Professor Shah, um, actually the ground Ganges Basin is going through a severe groundwater storage depletion. So if I, you know, figure out the signal, and uh, you will see this map of India on the left, where you have all these red areas, 
and this includes you know the all across the Ganges Basin, as well as uh, uh, the north, uh, the Indus Basin uh, on, the, on the left. So we're looking at the Ganges Basin, and uh, that's the satellite data from 2003 to 16. And you have this map of the Ganges Basin out down here, which is uh, 2000, 1985 to 2016, where I have two types of colors. One is the background color, which indicates the rainfall, you know, the rainfall pattern. And, uh, you know, from the color code, you can see the rainfall actually is coming up. It is increasing. Whereas, the, the dots out here, there are about, you know, about uh, 1,500 odd dots around. These are the points where we had groundwater level measurements from the Government of India databases for 1985 to 2016, about 30 years. And you will see that there are a lot of reds here. And these reds indicates the water level is actually falling, which is kind of, you know, uh, you know, matching up very well with those reds out here. So we did uh, what we call a numerical flow modeling um, of groundwater and water interactions. And uh, we simulated across a major chunk of the, uh, the, the Ganges, lower Ganges Basin. Um, and uh, we used uh, you know, the very traditional groundwater flow codes like MOTFO. And we found out that uh, as we increase the pumping, and as it has increased from 1970s and predicted for 2050, as the pumping is going up, per capita pumping is going up, the groundwater storage in those places are actually going down, matching pretty well with the satellite data. The response is pretty, pretty, you know, um, uh, pretty obvious. What is interesting is on the, on the other side, you'll see this um, this white side, which is what we call the base flow side, and this red side, which is stream flow capture. So from the second slide or third slide, where I showed that cartoon about the groundwater river water interaction, if you recall, base flow is where you still have a gaining stream. Groundwater is still coming to the to the river. Whereas in the stream flow capture, you have that actually the river water feeding the groundwater. So many of the stretches from about 2010 or mid 2005 or so afterward, many of the stretches are actually transformed to what we call stream flow capture. So instead, the groundwater feeding the river, we now have the groundwater actually getting fed by the river. So river water is disappearing to our, our knowledge, to our understanding, in a lot of sense to the groundwater. And we are not seeing it. We wouldn't be able to see it. So this is a cartoon that I would like to show you here, of course, uh, very, uh, uh, very conceptual, where we show that from 1970s to 2016, how the groundwater level mm -hmm. might have fallen in one, one uh, sample reach. And as the groundwater pumping has come up, you do have decrease in the base flow to the river. Consequently, the river stage has come down. And here are some numbers that show the calculated values of the volume that might have you know, decreased over the years. And again, we calculated that if the trend continues, um, in 2016, you know, instead of being a gaining river, now it has started to become a losing river in some stretches. And by 2050, you know, this, have, this would decrease even further. So at present, the summer base flow has decreased by about 59% of what it used to be in 1970s. I'm not saying it's for the whole river, but for major reaches of the river. And our calculation, if this goes this way, by 1970s, this would decrease up to 75%, which would actually be an existential crisis for the river itself. So, you know, over the years, I have taken photographs of the Ganges, as I have, that has been my first area for my researches over the years. And this is 2005 to this is 2016. You can tell it yourself. Now, I take this opportunity, uh, you know, to also talk a little bit on the, so, okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, so, subsequent to our study in, published in August, in November, uh, sorry, October, just two days or three days after uh, Professor Agarwal expired, we had this coming out. Um, I don't know how much this will be implemented eventually, but at least it came out in the public domain. Um, now, I take this opportunity to talk a little bit my contrary view to you know the Ganges water emission concept. So please pardon me on that. Um, so you know uh, maybe most of you would be knowing about this, but those who don't, in 1975, the, the concept of the Ganges water emission was published in the, uh, the very illustrious journal Science uh, uh, by Roger Neville and uh, Vilas Mirana. And uh, what it talks about in a nutshell is that uh, you have this you know, uh, this scenario, where you have the canals, you have the rivers, and you have a lot of pumps out here. And you have this, you know, box, which represents 
uh, uh, the aquifer in the subsurface. And this subsurface aquifer is an isotropic homogeneous sandbox aquifer. It doesn't have a heterogeneity. All right? And uh, so this aquifer will be filled with water in a normal time, groundwater. So as you start pumping, the groundwater falls off. And uh, in the, in the, so this was pre-monsoon. And in the early monsoon, you know, uh, the again. Post monsoon, it gets filled up again. And it you know, waits for the next hydrological cycle. Now, if you do have uh, insufficient monsoon or if you have excess surface water like floods or whatsoever, you can also go for an augmentation where um, you can build an artificial infrastructure and start filling up the aquifer. So the aquifer is now taken full. I think that's the crux of you know, the, what the Gagas Water Mission talks about. Now, I take this opportunity to say that, okay, you know, in principle it works fine, but you know, in practicality there are several complexities and that needs to be addressed. So it's not that simple. So this is a map that we created as a part of a British Zoological Survey article to study uh, three years back. Um, and we, we mapped out the whole Indus Ganges Brahmaputra Basin uh, as a transboundary system. And uh, you can see the heterogeneities that exist in the terms of the hydraulic conductivity and specific values across the basin. Now this is you know, very large scale. But then if you zoom in and you type sections from different parts of the basin, you see all these heterogeneities. So the sandbox that I showed you in the Ganges Water Mission as a concept is possibly much more complex than what we are envisioning. And that needs to be really taken into account. And more so because this area also has a quality issue. And through our studies, through my studies across the last 20 years, we have repeatedly showed that at least in the, in the uh, lower Ganges Basin, which is the West Bengal part and the Bihar part of the Ganges Basin, much of the arsenic in the groundwater is geogenic. It's coming from you know, natural sources, mostly the Himalayas. But much of the arsenic is actually liberated by some biochemical triggers, redox triggers, which are possibly started because of you know, changes in pumping regime. So my, my point here is that any unplanned groundwater intervention can irreversibly destroy the water quality forever. I mean, you cannot really do anything about it. So, you know, like these newspaper articles came out after our paper came out, is the Ganges, you know, on the verge of crime? Well, yeah, status quo, yes. But what's the other effect? The other effect is that it will, you know, significantly affect the food security and the SDGs. And of course, our calculation shows that by 2050, about more than 100 million people may face food security uh, by the induced water level of the Ganges. So it's, it's a, again, as uh, Professor Shah said, it's a double one. You know, it comes out of So the question is, that what is the future of the Ganges and adjoining groundwater? What do we do about it? The point is, the immediate answer, that at least we should have a baseline data set, which we don't have at present. Maybe the ministry has it, nobody knows about it. I mean, I talked to the ministry, several very senior officials, Nothing has come out, so we have started our own, you know, own uh, monitoring systems nowadays. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that only very scientifically prudent, comprehensive water management can save the Ganges for our future generation. Thank you. We have taken some technologies and tried to do MAR, manage aquifer research. I don't know that they have been used prolifically, like on a government scale. So I, I know that several of the government programs that has been proposed in Dr. Bhujan Jujana and PMSKY, they are looking and talking about that. I don't know if there is any scientific basis to it, honestly. Uh, uh, thank you. So one question I have, other than the about the Genji's water machine, you said like the uh, heterogeneity makes it difficult. But the other aspect that you showed, like uh, the rain has been increasing, uh, uh, some there has been a trend. But the groundwater, like, groundwater are going down. So does it mean that the ground level, which is getting depleted, is not getting like recharged up to the again the same? So level? recharge is a very complex process. It's not an instantaneous process, by the way. So the vertical flux, we know that as a hydrogeologist, we know the vertical flux are in meters per year. Okay, it's a very slow process. So the water rise that you see over the you know every monsoon, it's actually not from the research that happened last year. It is actually a system rebound from some you know other mechanical forces. The recharge takes place in a process what we call the imbibation and the drainage. So the water molecule come in, one molecule of air goes out, and this there is a mass balance process. 
As it happens, you know, like the Richard Water Clown said, the, the upper surface slowly gets saturated and it transmits in the lower. It's, we call it the piston type of flow. As it does so, you know, the upper surface would look that it's saturated. And you would assume that the whole system is not saturated. Actually, it's not. There is an unsaturation below the saturated level. So you, you do have a Vero zone, or what you call unsaturated zone, below a, satur a transient saturated zone as the water is coming down. So consequently, you know, any water that extra water that comes in and starts to enter the aquifer is now rejected and it forms a flood. So that water would actually, by you know, very common sense, by our you know, just mathematical calculation should go in, but actually it would not because the upper surface was saturated. Yeah, so that was the question. My question was that, uh, as you said, like it, uh, when these water machines consider aquifer a sandbox model, where e each year the water would recharge and fill up the game. Yeah. So what I'm asking is that based on a physical model and the observation, is it happening according to you? Is it physically happening or it's not? Because that's, not. It's not. Not. Because that's another point that would contradict the concept of Venti's water machine. As I said, in principle it works, it should work, but in practicality there is a lot of consideration that needs to go in. We'll take the one last question from Jisha. Is it possible to model? Is it possible? So if I, get, like, if I can model the, the river water interaction with the Yes, so as a part of this work, we did for a, you know, for a stage for the West Bengal part, but uh, in, in present time, like my, one of my students is actually working to develop for the whole system, whole system. Again, continue to the availability. Yes. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Thank I think you. The, it's clear the, the complexity of the system is one we'll continue to study for years, but we still also have three more presentations to help us clarify, and then we can have one larger discussion for the last presentation. Thank you so much. We'll turn now to Dr. Bharat Sharma um, to present on the Ganges water machine, groundwater, and the ATF which is the underground taming of floods. Thank you. I pay my tributes to Professor G.D. Agarwal, and uh, happy to be part of this one. You have heard about the whole basin itself, what are the problems, what are the physical uh, things happening, what the economic losses were happening. I am talking very, in that sense, in a very micro scale. I am trying to light a single lamp in the whole, you can say, the darkness which we are seeing around in the Ganges Basin. May that lamp sometime will have uh, intensity of light which is spreading to the whole basin, but that's what we did. The results which I am presenting today is the, um, can say, collaboration of so many institutions and the concept which was developed initially in Australia and tested in um, several other countries in Africa and Asia and then also in the Ganges Basin, which is called uh, UTFI. So, this, uh, the already we know that the Ganges Basin uh, is uh, draining out, as he said, that uh, there is a lot of groundwater which is not being recharged. At the same time, then what should we do? The main question is that we know, now understand the problem, that what we should come up with a solution, what we come up with. In the Ganges Basin itself, when we map the entire thing, we were able to find out that there are certain pockets, not in the whole of the basin, which have both the situation that they get flooded during the monsoon season and during the non-moon season, the water tables are declining. So we we'll try to find out those areas. Generally, what is happening that we put most of our recharge structures in those areas where there is already no water. If you see most of the groundwater recharge schemes either happening in Rajasthan or happening in other areas where practically very little water or practically no water is available for recharge. So we found out that whether there is a way out of doing it. So the concept of underground taming of floods for irrigation, that's the, uh, the old uh, concept of artificial groundwater recharge, but modified in the Ganges context and modified in the Indian context, that we know that the current situation is that we have the water table declining. In the monsoon season, when say there is a urban floods and other kind of things happening in certain areas, not the entire basin, especially in those areas. But if we put uh, implement this underground saving of floods, that if we can take a part of it and put it back into the aquifers through our aquifer recharge system, whether it is going to help us or something of that kind. 
just to take you to, to you to any typical village in the Ganges Basin, what it was and what it is today. If you enter any typical village in the Ganges Basin, can say about 30 years back, you will be greeted by a holy water body, a temple, or a gurdwara, or a mosque over there in each village. Because most of them, some of them may be boasting about three water bodies, four water bodies, etc. And can say people used to maintain them, worship them, everything. Now, if you visit the same village. You can see in the present context because the water governance has taken over by the government. It's a stinking, it's a septic kind of a tank which will, you will be greeted when you enter any typical village. Nobody takes care of it, nobody uses it. It's just an evaporation pond or something which, which is of practically no use to anybody. But it is there because it's the most uh, the kind of a depressed area, so the elevation wise, and the water is still coming out of that, but it's just evaporating, and maybe some part, 2%, 3%, or 4% of it is uh, still automatically recharging, but because the bottoms are sealed, so most of it is evaporating. So that gave us the idea that can we do something about it, and we found out that we visited several villages in the uh, Ganges Basin itself selected a particular district which is called Rampur district which is in the western UP part of the Ramganga sub-basin itself so based on certain number of criteria etc we came to a particular site which was uh, suitable from several parameters and everything there, there are several sites uh, of that kind of a nature and then when say based on that we try to convince the farmers that we are trying to implement a project of this thing where it will be useful to you whether you can say then physically you can say there was a memorandum of understanding with them signed to the project consultations they, they went on quite of, uh, elaborately and then we started uh, working on it. So we selected a stakeholders consultation even at the district level so we so that there is a um, uh, party who can take it over who can maintain it and can say uh, based on the uh, say chief development officer of that particular district and everything. So they agreed that this is a good idea and uh, perhaps it's a scalable as well. And then you can say the further consultations with they started. The bus is tourist, but we didn't go as tourists. So there was a, a large group of all from social economists, from hydrogeologists, from engineers, from groundwater people, everybody concerned, had large consultations, then started in, and then you can say that finally the project site was completed and it was uh, done over there. The basic concept premise, as he has, um, Abhijit just said that if we leave it to chance, there is very practical uh, possibility that it is not recharging. And say the what is so what we did that we put a number of structures there this is a standard design which most of the hydrogeologists or the hydrologists they know about it there is nothing very unique about it the uniqueness only comes in that we try to we use the village ponds which where the water will always be there every season you will be getting those water and then we designed those things and, and put it in a certain battery in certain uh, portion over there they design everything this was done in association with the central ground board and our own engineers had all just power public and other things who had the direct experience from Australia and everything that was done over there and then you can say the first season came when the water started flowing and we had this in 2016 the structure concept that started uh, getting water and everything over it and then we did a number of studies as well which shows that even from a single pond in during one year you can recharge water up to the tune of 40 to 60,000 meter cube uh, per uh, season you can say uh, per acre of that one and then we try to see the water quality we also had the silt fluxes the how much silt are going in or how much you, can, so you will need to renovate it every year every two three years and then you can so we did the hydroeconomic analysis also based on that you can say what is the return flow period, flood inundation, ground levels, how they will increase if it is scaled up to a larger kind of area. So this this is how it happened. It was it was looking something like this thing, and we started piloting it, working with the government and how we can take it up further. So then we showed them every those areas that this is the possibility and each pond has the capacity to recharge groundwater up to 60,000 meter cube uh, uh, of the flood water stored ground in 2017. So that's the kind of possibility. Then further, 
we work at the district level, state level, highest level, at the ministry level as well. You can see here, you can see those kind of meetings happening and everything. And we talk about convergence here, you can say the Manrega scheme. The government itself ordered that you can use these funds of that scheme for desilting it, re rejuvenating it, you can say, and putting it back into shape, you can say, to do that particular efforts. And we now know that status of, in, in a particular, even the Rampur district, which is in the up, you can say, it gets sufficient rainfall more than 12%, but if you see the over-exploited blocks in that one itself, you can say, there are one, two, three, four, those blocks, you can say, they are still over-exploited, and they, the areas they get also, almost routinely flooded as well. So those, those are the kind of perfect locations in the basin where these type of technologies can be taken up, and move. We then you can say scale, try to scale it up. It was the under the PM case why it was you can say again merged up and at the central level also this was taken. This was formed part of that one. The in one district itself they identified more than 50 sites where government will be using its own funds to prepare those kind of things and this is, has already started happening and uh, we try to take it further you can say over these things. So, so this is also by the central government agencies, National Water Mission, Central Water Board and everything. So we try to bring them on board and see that these things are happening. So in conclusion, we can say that ground recharge with front water for irrigation is the future of some very good thing that can happen. It can recharge up with thing and just by calculation that we can say that even one pond through that recharging, we about 30 hectare of wheat crop requiring four to five irrigation, five centimeter each can be additionally irrigated through the recharge, which will, or you can say it can be used just for building the groundwater. Water quality generally from the source water. So that was one of the concern of people that water quality should not be destroyed. We continuously monitored through our partners like Center Soil Center such you. So uh, at the, up to that stage, we didn't find anything which was of concern of this thing. And all those levels of those, uh, can say these things, they were below the detection limit and other things. So the water was of good quality. And uh, that's all can say. We are still striving to mainstream this particular pilot. And there is a uh, good amount of success, but we still want that it should be, become through the this. Thank you very much. Uh, right now, we have been successful with the government of Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest part of the Ganges Basin. We have not tried it in other basins, but uh, the same concept has been tried in other countries. In Vientiane, it, it is happening in a part of it in Bangladesh. We have identified several sites where Akeshi and some of our other partners, they are doing it. We are trying to see that uh, in what other states uh, this, this can be uh, taken up uh, right now. We are confined to Uttar Pradesh state where the largest areas because we did uh, entire mapping and then to the groundwater level fluctuations where the flood waters are available so that a lot of uh, groundwork was done for that. Similar work we have not yet done for other states. We have, an, uh, I guess, uh, if within Rampur we would need to scale up 1500 sites. So right now the district administration only. Them, they have showed interest and they have already like uh, kind of signed an order telling BDOs to identify sites and do this thing. On a global level also we have looked at the potential and there would be some other basins that have come out to be uh, potential, but that would be again uh, something going forward. Thank you. And that inspires along the co-author of yeah. the presentation. Um, so you mentioned that uh, is below permissible limits, yeah. but is that there is a sign of increasing concentration? Well, this project we have run it for three years, 16, 17, 18. So up to 18, can say we didn't find any. So they were still below the detectable limits. So then can say we didn't at this stage. If but we did you also monitor uh, the concentration in the ponds from where you are trying to? So we, we measured the water in the ponds itself and in the groundwater itself. So because we had a fear, this area is also one of the industrial area. This. Muradabad and uh, further areas where you have a lot of those uh, brass metal industry and a uh, lot of contaminants and other things they come. So people had that concern, several people from the state groundwater department and also central groundwater board means uh, generally people have those uh, septicals and other things. So we try to monitor and we didn't do on our own. One of our own Indian uh, partner, 
center soil servicing who have a beautiful laboratory and the kind of experts so they were the responsible but uh, nothing uh, abnormal or nothing uh, of concern was reported for this excellent we have two more questions that i can't resist Thank you uh, for the presentation and of, uh, I have a question on um, the groundwater risk because if the whole water will get percolated in some way or the other. How are the villagers responding? Yeah, that was a, uh, that's a concern. We were uh, quite aware of this problem. So the groundwater structures were maintained in that way. So in the local parlance, but they call it that Chuvani Bhar Pani to Bachana hi chahiye. Out, about 25% of the water should always remain in the pond. So we, the structures were designed in such a way that they will not take all the water. So depending upon the consultation with the villagers, how much water they want. So their uh, general concern was that at least 25% of the water should remain in the pond. You can take 75% of the water. So the structures were designed. So the basic of testing, the level of listing from where the charge is start happening. Uh, we took about 75% of the available recharge and 25% of the recharge was so that at least uh, one, one of the steps which I didn't mention that because initially all the village, uh, the septic water or say they bought from the drains and everything used to go to the same place. So first part, first step was to bifurcate that one. So that uh, part was uh, taken out. Not treat and bring to the pond. Bifurcation. Well, right now, because say bifurcation, we will do the treating is another. So, treating is simple on those locations. You can't put a plant. The only treatment is through settlement and other kind of things, which or use a sand filter. We can't put a treatment plant or to no, then the model becomes, you can say, very organic or something uh, which we can't afford those. We can't scale it up. So, those kind of so, but the bifurcation itself, the otherwise, even the village animals, uh, they, they can't enter into those kind of but after that. The water was uh, relatively clean and uh, this can be used for some of the other That's one of the advantages that about most of the households and mostly female that they say that the uh, mostly though it was kind of dirty so the people living around had the, some issues. So that's one of the few benefits that have unintended benefit that have come out. Yeah. And I guess today only the Gram Panchayat has signed this project that they would be taking over this site because the project is ending soon. So that's how we wanted it to be. Hopefully they would be able to like take over the site and all management part because that's how we can upscale it if we want to do it. Another output of the project is that we are publishing soon a handbook of UT5 uh, which can be used by all the other stakeholders etc. step by step that uh, the, what's the concept, how to within it, how to uh, negotiate with the village community, how to design it, how to do it, to monitor it, evaluate so the complete concept, uh, it will be coming out uh, very soon. That will be another product of so that I was struck by the difference in the in the framework of your your presentation versus Abhijit's presentation, because he's saying that excessive pumping is leading to declining groundwater, yeah. and that is actually removing the base flows, uh, cutting into the base flows. Instead, the river is a losing river. Uh, now you are trying to increase the recharge from the uh, during the flooding season. Yeah. Uh, but then you see that will be actually enable us to produce more agricultural output in the in the dry season. So you are in a sense treating that recharge as still reserved for agriculture, whereas he's saying I mean, that's you know, data also showing that there is over exploitation, which means that recharge should actually go uh, you know eventually build up the table and go as base flow. Right? There is uh, what I can say, but um, Fares can also add. Uh, overall, what we have been at least in uh, about uh, 200 meter range, we put the piezo meters. I, I have not put you can say everything uh, on the loan, but you can say we put the piezo meters all around the can say that what is the impact of this recharge on groundwater level. We noticed that there was some kind of a build up of groundwater. The villagers, they were in the yields of the wells, they slightly improved, even the hand pumps yield they improved. So there is not an, any further increase. Only thing is some of uh, the areas which they was the, our calculation show that some of the areas in years of drought for such thing. So th this water will be available for uh, improving uh, for uh, giving more irrigation or using it more efficiently. But uh, the choice can still be made that whether we just want to leave the water to um, help uh, building groundwork or we can use it. Villagers will always want 
that there should be more water and easy availability of water. The discharges from the pump should increase. Women need that the hand pump which they are using, they are using lesser force to draw water for domestic use, etc. So those are the same. Thank you very much. Should I talk with this Yeah, just to, this, uh, just to say at the night in last three years we haven't seen any observed increase in area. So whatever we are recharging, we can supposedly safely say that either it remains in aquifer or it's adding to the base flows. So one thing is helping to the farmers that over the period of time it will build up the groundwater levels because it's mostly diesel irrigation that's what happening, which is quite costly. So that's I guess right now the current condition is that number was just a just to explain how much cubic meter water is. So the thing is, you know, this this uh, feedbacks they are kept timeless. So you know, you would think that you would research that before and to the only translate to either this flow or building up that flow. It doesn't happen. It takes a quite a bit of time before it starts, you know, giving some feedback. And again there is a mass balance, like how much water you put in and how much water you have. Uh, so you know the storage will slowly increase if the taking out water is less in volume than what you put in. So from our study, and this is something I forgot to mention before the end, like that uh, NASA website features that I showed you. I, I told you that there are these blue dots that you can see and I'll come back to this and I forgot to come back. What we did see that in certain parts of the country, uh, in Uzzab specifically, certain parts of Andhra Pradesh and other places, we actually are seeing groundwater replenishment. Yeah. And uh, it's taking in a you know, regional scale, it's not just one point. Even Modi is showing that. <laughs> so, but the, the only point is it has to be done judiciously and scientifically. Yes. So, and in an attempt both to divert from the political discussion and actually to move forward to the political discussion, our next speaker, Himanshu Thakkar, will be talking to us about what the government should be doing to clean the up. And then we'll open up to discussion at the end as well. Please. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, I don't have a presentation because the kind of question that was given to me, uh, cleaning the Ganga, what should the government do? I thought I'll just make some points about that. Uh, see, I think the first thing is that for cleaning the Ganga, you know, there is a general consensus that just cleaning the sewage or the pollutant is not going to help. What you need is a flow in the river. So, uh, what number of people are saying, including Nitish Kumar or Jairam Ramesh or even Vipi Singh, the Secretary of the Water Resources, told us in our India water meeting. Water river, rivers meeting this last week was that you need flow to dilute the pollution, dilution of pollution is required. Now, how to achieve that? There is no vision in the world. In fact, there doesn't seem to be an attempt also. But I think we need to work in that direction. So, the first thing that we need is that, you know, following what you know, Shah says, they're generalizing more generally that groundwater is India's water life is, is our main state. Most of our water we are getting from groundwater and increasing proportion of it. So our national water policy needs to firstly acknowledge that reality. Today the national water policy is not even acknowledging that reality. If you acknowledge that reality that the groundwater is water lifeline, then a lot of things follow from there. Then we have to work towards sustaining that life, which will mean that Instead of the surface water projects where we are spending most of the money, we spend money in, for example, increasing the rainwater harvesting, groundwater recharge, increasing, uh, I mean, uh, the reducing the demands uh, and number of uh, such things. And instead of spending money on surface water, which are actually surface water projects, which are actually destroying very large proportion of the existing groundwater recharge systems. You know, for example, the Gain Betwa link, just one link, the river link project, the first top link, is going to destroy, I mean, the cutoff. How many trees do we know? 23 lakh trees. That one project will have to need to cut off. Trees of adult size, now. And the Forest Advisory Committee said that by the time the deforestation tanks will come, there will be 23 more lakh trees that will be destroyed. 
So we are destroying forest, we are destroying wetland, we are destroying. And instead of that, if our water resource manage policy accepts the groundwater as a lifeline as a reality, then we need to strive to protect these systems, which recharge the groundwater in a big way. So that's the first thing I feel. And along with the national water policy change, I mean that will dictate a number of other changes, we also need a national urban water policy. Today, most cities are finding easy solutions. They are not managing their water properly. No, no, no city, not even national capital. They are not harvesting rain, they are not recharging groundwater, they are not managing groundwater, they are not pro protecting local water bodies, uh, they are not treating their sewage, they are not doing any demand side management, their transmission distribution losses are 40%, 30%, and so on. And they are not doing anything to cut off. When, when they need more water, Okay, Delhi needs more water, so then they take from Bhakra, then they say we need more water, so Dairi, then they need more water, so build more dams, Lakwar, Renuka, Kishao, and then after that, they have a river plan, Sharda, Yamuna, Ring, Link Canal, to take water from one another river basin. So this is the kind of easy solution every city goes for. So I think the footprint of urban areas is increasing. And so we also need to guide the urban water this thing, national urban water policy, as to guide them what is it, what the, what is should be the right, or you know, in our uh, political parlance, what is the water smart city? And we are talking about smart cities, but we have no definition of what is the water smart city. So we need a water smart city which actually does all that, what I listed earlier. And if it does that, then its footprint will decrease, and actually its its use of the local resources increase and its, its its impact on the river downstream will decrease and so on. And then in the impact on the Ganga, for example. So that's the second thing I want to highlight. The third thing is that uh, the the e flows notification that came on 10th of October, a day before uh, Agrawalji died, uh, is actually a fraudulent notification. You mentioned that also. It's a completely fraudulent notification. It's a retrograde step. It's non-serious actually. There's no, and it's unscientific. There's no basis for science. It just has a thumb rule. In fact, the best way to assess the, the environment flows is has come from the ministry itself. In March 2015, a three-member committee comprising Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Water Resources, and Vinod Tare came out with not what should be the flow. But what is the methodology for assessment of environment flows in India? And that assessment methodology should be used to assess how much flow is required. And that much flow should be is what should be required, if not all of that what you are suggesting. So uh, today, you know, for example, what you have suggested in flow from the Darura barrage and Bijnor barrage and the Agnipun barrage is 36 and 70 QMX. Actually, the current water average water flow from all these barrage downstream is higher than that. So it seems more, as some of the people at the India River Speak say, it seems like a scheme to increase the water use from the Ganga rather than allow environment flows. So you know, just build the minimum datum level and then use all the additional water. So uh, that seems the likely. So that's uh, the problem with the whole. And you know, and who is when is it supposed to happen? Those flows even, those, those uh, minuscule flows, three years from now. Whereas we have been talking about Avira Ganga for a decade now. The NGBRA notification of 2009 talks about Avira Ganga. And today in 2018 we are talking about minuscule flows in three years from now. And who will assure that three Who will assure that uh, it flows even? The notification says, it will be assured by either the project developer or by the Central Water Commission. The Central Water Commission is India's lobby for big dams actually, unfortunately. It is complete, it has been telling us, we have been talking, asking for inflows for about two decades now, and what they have been telling us, that inflows is a luxury that India can ill afford. This is Central Water Commission's mindset, even today. So that body, how is it going to assure environment flows actually? So that uh, notification is a completely fraud. And in fact, you know, there was an earlier notification which came out with a lot of effort actually. 
the 7th October 2016 notification, the Ganga Authority notification. That actually provided a three-tier system of governance of the river Ganga. The district level, the state level and the national level. And it said that how that governance is supposed to happen at each of that level. And it gave timeline of different steps that are necessary to achieve, including starting from, it defined actually what is the flood plain of the river. A hundred year flood level, which is the flood plain of the river. And that needs to be protected, that needs to be remarked. And so on. The number of steps it said, that has not been implemented at all. And in fact, that was an instrument for dissolution of NGBI. He says NGBL was a vibrant institute where there were a lot of independent people participating in decision making process. That was destroyed through that notification and that notification was never implemented. In fact, to the extent that the highest body under that notification, National Ganga Council, under the Prime Minister, how many meetings were there of that council? Zero, absolutely. Not one meeting of that council at so that's the level of actually intention, I feel, of actually doing something. So you know, and in fact, and the, the other, another demand of uh, J.D. Agrawal was Ganga Bill. But the Ganga Bill draft that they are going to bring in the parliament next week is if you look at it, it's actually even more draconian. It's not what, it is what something J.D. Agrawal has rejected already, that bill. He has a, his own draft of the bill, which is what he wanted it to be passed in the Parliament, and discussed in the Parliament. Now, this bill actually gives the center even more powers and takes away all the powers from the state, which is against India's constitutional situation, actually, and number of problems in that. So, uh, what we need is, is actually, you know, to bring a political win, uh, which is, you know, the first thing that is required. And we need, we, uh, J.D. Agrawal was trying to achieve that, but I think a lot more work will have to be done. But these are the, some of the basic steps that are necessary. One can talk about a lot of different things. For example, sewage treatment plan, 20,000 crores is being spent. What is that they spending on? More sewer lines and more sewage treatment plan. But we already have a large sewage treatment capacity. What is the performance of that? And why are we not able to put those less uh, capacity into uh, uh, performance, I mean achieve performance? No, we are not, not doing really anything credible to do. Instead, we are putting more of the same centralized sewage treatment plants. That's not going to work. Because 30 years we have been doing exactly that. And in fact, now it's 44 years since 1974 Water Pollution Act. We have been doing just that. But there is not even one success story. I have been asking this question. 1974, we set up the Water Pollution Act. And through that, we set up state, central and state pollution control boards. The whole bureaucracy paraphernalia. Is there one success story of this bureaucracy on central this pollution control bureaucracy? Where they can show they have cleaned up one stream, one area, one river. After 44 years, after so much bureaucracy, not one. We show there is something fundamentally wrong in that. We are not doing anything to address that. Instead, we are saying that we will set up STPs and we will create a new uh, high uh, NULP model which will, through which we achieve that through this economic, some uh, jugglery, we will be able to achieve the clean water. That's not going to happen. So, what we need instead is actually more decentralized biomedical remediation kind of methods, what you know has worked in a number of some other places. So, uh, I mean, we can talk about, log, for example, uh, you know, there is a major problem in the kind of data we have about the Ganga. So, you know, how it's, it's much more easier. You know, for example, if you look at a, AP, Water Resource Management System, it's unbelievably fantastic. It's a dream come true kind of water uh, uh, data system in India, where on real time basis, every day, you not only get river flows, you not only get reservoir data, reservoir levels and storages, you not only get water storage in the tanks every day, real time basis. You not only get the water storage in the con in the water conservation structure. Not only in the ground, 17,000 piezometer based groundwater data comes to the uh, website every day. But even soil moisture level comes through there. And 
that's that kind of system that that's been working for one and a half years now. That's what we need for Ganga in the first place. That kind of information system which will put out on every day all this uh, information. If it could be possible for a whole state like Ganga, why can't we do it? Maybe why can't it happen for Ganga? So it's very much possible. There are issues of you know sharing with international bodies, etc. But I think it's uh, I think even the UP Singh, when he came to our meeting, he, he accepted that at the age when you can keep the hydrological data secrecy is over. It's not going to continue. We need to go in that direction. So, uh, I mean, a number of other steps one can uh, uh, actually list. But I think more important than what is possible, you know, technical solution, what is possible. How are we going to achieve that change, to achieve that, is more important. And that's the direction in which we all need to go, I think. That's very sober. Um, I would like, that, like to open this up also um, uh, to, to um, we, we do have one more presentation, and I want to make sure that we get through that presentation. Um, because it's, it's very important to open up to the, to the broader discussion. But this issue of how we create political level and policy environment, there are so many technical solutions, so much we still have to learn about the technical solutions and the dynamics of the river system. And all of those good ideas come to naught. We don't have a administrative and institutional political system which ready to actually implement those ideas. So, quick uh, questions or thoughts. With this, uh, with this one, as Tusha mentioned, mom, deeply pump, but without really looking at the detached part. So, there's so much of area irrigated and all diversions, but without looking at the recharge, recharge part. And what we are trying to do is, we were trying to do is, you know, what is the potential right now in that, uh, in, in the current setting, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, Gandhi sort of mentioned. So what I'm presenting is basically the first paper. It's a basic kind of synthesis paper, and there are several papers we publish it in uh, different journals. If you want more details, uh, you can look at. And in fact, we have what we have done. There was uh, yeah. I, I think I don't need to dwell on this one. Everybody knows about the concept, the outcomes, you know. So what we have done basically, we have looked at the whole Gandhi's uh, the basin. And then looked at the sub basin level, what some accounting, uh, and then within the basin, uh, we have done some modeling studies and looked at some of the water sheds, water shed level where it can be done and how how it can be done, and what is the potential, what is the potential, how it can be done. So at three levels, we have conducted some uh, uh, the uh, modeling studies. So what I what I'm presenting is basically. Uh, at macro level, but you know you can find details uh, like uh, Abhijit, you mentioned that you know it's, it's not possible uh, in some places. Yes, even in Ramgang basin, we found that you know it's a it's not a potential basin, but there are locations where it can be. But you need you need to have some rules, and if you can maintain those rules, you know you can continue with the uh, machine kind. But of course, you need uh, as uh, Bharat mentioned in this uh, retail structures. So anyway, uh, this is the macro picture. You know, you know, most of the water is, uh, uh, you know, in Ganges you get it in a four, four months time, and right now in you know, a irrigation basically consume water only 107 cubic uh, billion cubic meters. So uh, the average flow is basically about 383 million, billion cubic meters. Much of that is basically uh, flow right now in the Harding Bay is basically during the, uh, the monsoon season. So flow during the non-monsoon season is very low. And in fact, from 70s to after 70s, and, uh, because uh, there's, uh, without the, uh, there's, there's no rainfall recharging uh, the groundwater during that, that period, dry period, rabi and uh, after the season. So most of the, basically, that drop of uh, river flow is basically due to downward pumping. Yes, that, that is in some basins, 
and so on, uh, see where the, the potential for Gandhi's water, water machine still exists. So we followed this particular IMI uh, concept, you know, looking at water accounting, uh, looked at all the uh, process, non-process evaporation, uh, and which, from which sources uh, it is coming from, uh, ground water, uh, surface water, and so on. Uh, and we did with this one for all sub basins, uh, sub basins. And what we are trying to do is, you know, right now, the, all those irrigation meets only part of even what they call the net irrigated area. Uh, across, you know, if you look at all this, uh, the, the dry season, even dry season. So, recharge part. Then you can't have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ground. And this water machine in the uh, western part, and also in this part, this yellow uh, uh, color basins, sub basins. These are also have very low potential. Now we have done some, uh, you know, look, looked at uh, the economics of doing this one. You know, it looks very good, but where it can, how it can be done is the main question. As Abhijit, Abhijit mentioned, you know, where to pump? That's a major issue. And even within uh, Ram Ganga, we looked at small uh, watershed. And in one watershed, some watershed, you can, you know, uh, you can basically pump up to uh, five meters, maintain level up to five meters. Below that, basically, it is a losing river. So, if you keep, keep some rules for groundwater pumping, that can be done in some places. But somewhere else, other, in other places, of course, you need more recharge. So over time, you can build the groundwater supply, and then it can maintain the uh, the uh, groundwater level by using the complete pump recharge pump, deplete pump, PPDR, PRDP cycle. Now, this took to you know these are based on ground you know data that you have mentioned. See, you can look at two points A and B, and the A is basically a groundwater level depletion. And where you, you should not try uh, uh, groundwater recharge, uh, the pumping uh, without real recharging. You, know, you can't have the groundwater ground this water machine in this place. But in point B, it's more or less uh, uh, stable, where you can do to some extent, but you still have to maintain uh, some level of recharge. And to answer where it, it, ha it has been found that it can be done, in, you, you may have seen some papers in uh, Bangladesh. Where you know it's basically they have pumped before the monsoon, and then with the monsoon rains, floods, they basically uh, raise the groundwater level into the, the previous uh, before uh, monsoon level. Uh, so there are places where it can be done. Only thing is to you need to do a modeling at very modeling or studies at very micro level, and that's the that's the uh, the, the challenge uh, in this particular. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, here's another one. Now, we know that uh, the energy, uh, you know, in most areas it's, it's energy free. And where can you find energy for uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of pumping, uh, additional pumping? And of course, we know that uh, Tusha is doing some uh, studies. In the, uh, it can be uh, uh, attractive, but you know how to prevent the uh, over pumping of uh, the aquifers. This we need to discuss. But some of the challenges. Environmental flows. We looked at environmental flows also. So if you look at uh, uh, the, the, these environmental flows as immediate, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, basically um, uh, study, you know, we have six classes. Of course, the way it is right now, we can't maintain, uh, there's no normal uh, Ganga, no virgin flow, you can't maintain that. But you can at least maintain some level of, uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental flow by by even if you uh, pump a little bit more. So that we need to understand this. at the ba basin level, Gandhi's basin level, it can be done. But we need to look at it, small uh, parts of the basin where how uh, you know how it will not affect the uh, the, uh, the environmental flows. And the other uh, challenge. Basically, we already somebody already talked about the water quality. So, where you can have pump at recharge as well as pumping depends on the water quality. It's not just the uh, the uh, the arsenic. There are other issues also. So.
so we we need to we have looked at many other water quality parameters and uh, done some modeling uh, studies and see where those can be uh, the, where, where how it will affect these potential areas so we that is not a simple thing we you know even for this study two three year study we have done very macro level uh, analysis and uh, we need to do my, very micro level analysis to understand uh, how UT, even UTF pipe can be uh, you know upscale without really affecting quality without really affecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the what do you call the uh, river river flow uh, gaining river or losing river because once you give recharge people want to pump more and more so we need to understand where it can pump right after recharge and where we should not pump right after recharge in in ranga in in rampur you know at least it's not they are not pumping more right now because they don't have any area left perhaps for pumping you know because all the areas is irrigated right now. and uh, fortunately in most of the area 90% area is irrigated uh, in ganges there's hardly any more area so in that sense we know that uh, Uh, irrigation can be used, but only to meet that uh, small unirrigated area, unirrigated part of the net irrigated area. Now we need more analysis from our side, you know, what we can say to understand all these uh, complexities in the basin. Uh, but still, at, at the sub even sub basin level, we have done some analysis where it can be possible. And some of the you have seen some of the basins where it cannot be possible to maintain pump. Pump recharge with the Ganges water machine without recharging over a long period of time. I think I will stop it here and open it for this. But I think we should begin to ask the right questions. We're talking about an ecosystem that has multiple interacting variables. Groundwater and surface water are our artificial siloed definitions. We should not get too stuck into it. Uh, how do we understand this complex system? How do we define it? How do these different system components interact with each other? Let's try and understand that. Uh, because I feel a machine. Whenever you use the word machine, I think it 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 tends to take this whole discourse to the, an engineering sort of a uh, understanding where where everything has to be efficient, where all drops of water has to be put to use. Nothing should be left to the, to ecosystems. So I think uh, let's begin with that understanding. Uh, even if at the end of the session, it's not an easy thing to answer in in a course of a session. But uh, even if we begin to ask the right question, I think. Uh, That's perhaps a good start. Owners, and if we have to be really giving about data source and all, we have to really uh, be empathizing the government to half of them are who are even illiterate. So know-how of knowledge in the government is kind of a mockery of by us. Because if we do not have data, how do we expect them to have data? So I think somewhere down the line, as scientists, we have to really talk about conscience within ourselves. Are we sharing data enough in the public domain to be used for further use? Let us ask each other. 
and I, I, I will stop here. I wanted to go back to the question you had raised earlier about Didi Agarwal's list of demands. I was just wondering whether we have even really, even tangentially uh, discussed any of those. I mean, it seemed like one key demand was uh, no more dams. Um, now you could argue that well, hydropower dams will make the regime more towards e-flows by sending the water in the non-monsoon periods, maybe. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But certainly irrigation dams are going to only increase ET in the, in the region, right? So. Uh, the discussion so far, whether the Ganges water machine, machine is working, not working, and how to make it work, seems to still be in the developmental mode, in the sense that we need to have more ET in the basin. At the end of the day, we are saying that we need to have more ET in the basin, more production, therefore more ET, and how to make that work without maybe completely depleting e-flows or base flows or something like that. And we're not asking the question as, have we reached, not necessarily basin closure in the uh, conventional sense where we say, you know, there is no outflow to the uh, ocean, but substantial depletion of flows, uh, you know, the Ganges water machine, as far as I understand, assumes that there is a lot of room to increase ET in the basin. That's the starting point. Uh, and a lot of room from an e-flow perspective, from a Bangladesh perspective, from, you know, any kind of downstream uh, perspective. And I think that's the core assumption behind that machine idea. Is that really the case now, 50 years later, yeah. that you know, so we should really make that assumption? Ganges water machine was proposed, they were talking about 138 uh, million cubic meters. We are only concerned about 170 million cubic meters. So the, That's right. Let's see, you need to look at the, right now 380 billion cubic meters of water within the system, at least at hard That's the data we need to uh, not from India, but from uh, Bangladesh. Okay. Sorry. Now we assume that it's all kind of what we take it. And three, out of 380 billion, uh, much of that is uh, monsoon flow. You can't uh, save, store it in uh, storage, much of that storage in uh, Gandhi's. Even uh, groundwater, I don't think that, you know, that much can be stored. So there will be flow. Only thing is how do you, how do you mean, how can you maintain some storage so that flow will, uh, there will be flow in the dry season while uh, meeting uh, that irrigation. That's why Gandhi's automation, at least the retail part is very important right now. I think one of the signs of the really seminal paper, which the Gandhi's water machine has read it, and everyone has heard about it, and everyone walks away with a different picture in their mind of what was meant. So when the Gandhi's machine, water machine was introduced to me, and I read the paper quickly, it was always introduced to me as a machine that would allow much more efficient conjunctive use of surface and groundwater. And the work that I had done on the machine as well, when before in me when I was at the World Bank, was looking at the relative storage potential in the Ganges water machine versus the upstream Himalayan dam opportunities. And what we found in the study that I had worked on was that there was far more storage capacity, far more storage capacity, if we essentially work the groundwater harder, in, in, even in the more shallow aquifers, than all the combined storage potential in the economically feasible dams that they were looking at across the Himalaya. So, you know, it becomes one of these one of these pictures, and I agree that machine sounds terrible. It sounds like, you know, it's a, an inhuman output that cares not for the farmers or the, or the, or the environment. But it's interesting because the way that it was introduced to me, and I suppose therefore the way I've always thought about it, was using green infrastructure more efficiently. Avoid putting dams necessarily in the upstream if they're not necessary, if we can use the groundwater more mindfully. Cognizant of the, of the risks that you run with arsenic and, and, you know, and other issues. And cognizant of all of the incentives that are complicated where what you're talking about in large part is uh, suggesting that farmers who have access to canal water should actually invest in two wells. What I saw was so interesting about our, our previous discussion, actually, um, I'm not sure how many of you were in uh, Tushar's, the, the session we just had on Sub-Saharan African irrigation and small-scale farmers, which is the enormous amount of investment that has gone in anyway. So it's, it's, it's a phenomenal thought exercise, this Ganges water machine, and what we all think about in terms of what is infrastructure, what are the incentives, you know, and, and, and where we're going. Um, sorry, let me open that up.
I just wanted to say one thing before the session ends. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased that there was such a session. I urge Tushar very much to make sure that there was one. And, and given the importance of the problem, I'm hoping that uh, the future Tata EV meetings every year will discuss this issue and track the progress or lack thereof and try to communicate what comes out of these meetings to the politicians. They may or may not adopt them, but I think they should certainly not claim that they didn't know that there were solutions or there were approaches that they should be following. And there is a lot of learning that can take place just from the, the brain power that exists in this room. So I hope that Imi Tata will play an important role in the future in continuing this very major issue for India. Just uh, two comments, but well, two comments actually. Uh, can everybody hear me? So, you know, like when you're talking about this pumping, and again, you know, like the basic concept is it's like a sandbox and you just pump out, you know, the water just comes out. Actually, because of the heterogeneity, you know, there are different layers of the aquifer, right? Even in a, in a small scale, at least. And what's happening now, and I have the data, I cannot show it here because it's kind of working on it. Um, in the shallow level, the pumping is happening and because of augmentation of various sorts, either that is not or not, the water level has kind of stabilized in most of the Kansas basin. Whereas, the deeper aquifer has started to pretty extremely fast. So, you know, if you have the plots like this, from the shallow aquifers, deeper aquifer is going like this. So, that's an impending danger. It's not in the arena yet, but it's going to show up in the next five or so years. So that's something we need to be really cognizant about. And once the deeper aquifer, which is generally a very ancient water, like thousands of years old, that water depletes, it's really hard to, you know, rejuvenate it. Uh, the second point that I want to make, and again, uh, excuse me for my lack of knowledge maybe, uh, there are these government of India schemes that are being floated, like Art Eco Party, and so on, I think the next one is having that conversation. Uh, what I understand that they have proposed that every block of this country, which is about 7,000 more blocks in this country, needs to now get enhanced pumping, <coughs> as well as enhanced artificial research. Now again, on a conceptual level, that might sound very, you know, very easy thing, but, you know, those who are in the field and we work on this, we know that, okay, they are devilizing the details. So that's something we need to highlight, you know, maybe if we have access to highlight that. But even without doing our, you know, our base level survey, base level assumption, it's our, you know, we're going for a catastrophe for, if we try to do that. Yeah, yes. I think, it's a great satellite data that most of financial India is witnessing a rising water, which is contrary to what everybody thinks is happening. And uh, you gave an explanation, but I think that explanation is very scripty. I think we need to understand better why. What has been the night? I don't think uh, we can say that uh, government programs and policies. Uh, in some places it's working, and uh, that's again, it depends on the heterogeneity of the vacuum force. The places that I you know, showed the data yeah. for, mostly Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, they have what we call fractured systems. And if you have focused research, you know, it doesn't get distributed as much as it would. And in those areas, you know, the groundwater, you know, uh, augmentation of research, oh, sorry, the storage build up, do much faster. And so, yeah. What are you uh, It can be semi regional It doesn't need to be very localized. And it can store, you know, like, so uh, in the period of uh, 2018 this year, so uh, the PM uh, to his monkey bar, he talked about, uh, you know, diverting much of the farm of the Mandela to basically what I talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, going for more augmentation and to, uh, you know, digging up ponds. It will work in some places, it will not work in places. And so just taking a blanket observation and a blanket policy might actually be counter-defeating. Uh, so it is, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, I think you cannot have a policy for every village. I mean, the way the governments work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, we should calculate, which is 48,000 pounds. We keep deciding, 
Things are going to work. And I don't think, I can't imagine any rich Britain in which there will be a plan for every village. No. You look at the hydrogen of your village. Not every village, but at least some level of scale uh, that should be done. And the data is there when the central government was sitting on 40,000 logs, I know that. It's just a matter of integrating it to some kind of, you know, the key generation model. Can I ask one more question? Can we, can we run some kind of a thought experiment? It's supposed for 15 years. We just leave Kangalwa. We'll have all the flows into the Ganga without any diversions. Even the new arterial level flows, the storage we used to augment. Ganga's needs is a flows. What will happen to the Ganga flows? You see that there are nine dimensions involved. It's not just a sandbox. But over a 12 to 15 year period, when pumping keeps going on, but Ganga itself becomes a killing river. Pumping is status quo. Yeah, I'm going to get started, it's cool. Uh, yeah, if you slow it enough, yes. Because you're escaping the flow, so if you just do a mass balance, let's say the 1,000 milligram, sorry, 1,000 kilograms of volunteer from the river, and you're reducing the flow by half, you have to double the concentration. So yeah, so in your flow, you can see it's very different. Yeah, right, exactly. What he's saying, yeah. it has really has been not been possible for 15 years. Your groundwater is remain the same. Right. What is the status of the river? The I don't it's possible to make it So, if we want, we can actually have a better So, the groundwater, you know, like if the river level is half up, and let's say the groundwater is here, right, uh, at this, and the river level is here, so it is far from the river. Now, let's say the groundwater is responding to this story, which it would, uh, unless there is augmentation. And the river level comes up, the river will start now feeding to the groundwater, and it will be a, like a consensual dance in both. It will go. It will go. It will go. At least in the surrounding, yes, within the buffer region. Yes. But it's not the mainstream, you cannot talk about the river. For example, Barnsager Dam, year after year, when the monsoon comes, 70% full every year. Last 2005, when it was commissioned, there is no water use. That water, that can easily be used for environment, huge environment for the river. So, just a uh, sort of quick point, and not to belabor it again and again, but broadly, I think whenever one discusses in groups what needs to be done, there's a broad consensus on what needs to be done. But how is it to be done? That remains always uh, unanswered. And again, in the last presentation, as was coming up, it was clear that sub basins are units of exploration, of solutions, of identifying problems. We do not have an institution at all looking at sub basin basin rivers. Why cannot the life of me to escape me. Why cannot states create sub basin institutions? Because most of the sub basins are within states. It's not even interstate. So it's it's a uh, lot of conversations we've had when we are doing the Karnataka state water policy draft. It, that imagination is not going. The second point is that we have 20th century institutions which are dealing with 21st century problems. We did a great job in creating those 20th century institutions. For example, again, the urban uh, water utility that we created in our city in 1964 was the first water utility in India. They did a fabulous job of transporting water to the city. But now when it comes to managing groundwater, managing water locally, the institution does not have a single hydrogeologist. So you can do all the presentations that you want on hydrogeology. The capacity of that institution to absorb that knowledge is zero. So therefore, how do we build these institutional capacities, governance capacities to listen and then to act and then to be accountable and then to be empowered to do that? These are critical questions. And I do not know what are the kind of specializations that are required to be able to get this done. The only way the World Bank used to do it, and this one example that I had was to bring a ton of money and say that, hey, you need to create this institution if you want that ton of money. Uh -huh. 650 crore rupees for the JSYS. And even that did not last. Yeah, last. Even that did not last. Even with the, when the ton of money was spent, the institution disappeared. So this institution building challenge and this governance challenge is at the root, and especially groundwater governance challenge, it's at the root of all our problems. And if we don't crack it, we don't have the time. 
I mean, the rivers will not have flow, the groundwater will not flow, the agriculture is not there. The last point again, somehow the focus is on productivity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, agriculture. But in our part of uh, India, at least, surplus is the challenge. Market prices uh, collapse and their farmers using the scarce groundwater to grow even scarcer tomatoes and then throw it on the ground. And here we are obsessed <laughs> somehow of making water available through drip irrigation, sprinkler, whatever groundwater augmentation, when the market is not existing. And it, it beats me as to how one has to deal with even institutionally this kind of a challenge. So just wanted to flag that at 6.45. <laughs> Like that's the case. Like your last question first. So there is a recent study by Isa, uh, like Yashwini uh, and others, where they showed that globally, India followed by Pakistan and then the US, they have the highest water footprint in the global market of export. So in India, we, we are the highest exporter of water in the world. That's number one. And number two is your question on the institution and how we can manage possibly. So I'll bring you my experience when I used to work for the government of Texas. So in Texas, which is a very water scarce place, uh, there are 16 major river basins. And these river basins, 16 river basins, each would have their own, what we used to call the GAM, GAM, Groundwater Accessibility Model. Uh, like it's a model, uh, very intricate model with a lot of system response built into it. And what it will do is any change that, you know, you are, any major change that you're going to do in that model, either surface water or groundwater, Somebody out there in the, in, the, in the government would run that model with that change scenario and see the feedback and accordingly go, go for the license. So that needs to be brought in at some point. So I was asked to write the vision 2020 for government of Uzbek uh, for drinking water availability and so on. I, I brought that in. Like I, I said, like, okay, if you are planning for a longer time, you need to build this practice for Uzbek well. You go for typologies, you identify what are the surface water, what are the groundwater, and you build this, you know, this district, groundwater districts. And then Sorry, hydrological industry, groundwater and surface water districts. And then you go for you know combined solution. Uh, I I think it just got lost in the in the data. Interesting in our on the same lines, uh, in our meeting, uh, I think Delhi Professor Hussain said that when you do district level, you know every district needs to have a budget. And that budget needs to build up that how much water is available and how much is to be released for the river. So it, it includes the water available required for the river and the balance is to be used only that within the district. So you know, that needs to be the model, government's model for each district. And, and possibly of course sub-district level and so on. And that's what is required. Well, the geopolitical boundary is, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, it's a double edged show. Yeah, I understand that I mean, district administration yeah. part, but if you do a geopolitical boundary, you're missing the bigger picture. So, I think I'll add one point to the geopolitical boundary. We did some volumetric assessment saying that these are districts like not per, per se water, but by smart agriculture. If we go to the government, invest in these districts, and within these districts, we rest go to these blocks. Government won't do it because they have to spend in each and each district, they have to spread the money out. That's what their political conservation is. So, that pass comes into picture. I think we, we can keep on debating it for long. That's it. Our role of, uh, sorry, like, yes. our role of uh, people like Manju Chakkar and Tushar Sazar have that, that if we can even talk about mindset change because now Ganga is actually seen as a machine. Nobody even talks about its uh, ecosystem. So the mission has changed to machine actually. The no, no, I think is this, is a, this is a very it's more about production. Can we really even talk and change the mindset? Because that mindset has percolated at the district level as well. I'm telling you because I'm an urban planner uh, by profession. So everything for the government is about development and construction. So everything has to be related where there is money involved, roads, flyover, bridges, beaches, even water bodies, they want to construct everything. Okay, so let me try to wrap up wrap up here because I think that this is a really good point and I think it brings us back to the question of the, this is the this is the GD Agarwal in Colombia. And I think that uh, the very courageous GD Agarwal was gave his life um, trying to change this perception. I think certainly none of us in this room see that river as a machine. Um, and we all have uh, we all have a responsibility to take the knowledge that we have and put it into the debate 
to, to share the complexity of the system and the challenges, um, not just the hydrological side, but the administrative, the political, the equity, the ecosystem, the, the range of issues that are involved in managing the resources, complex and precious as the river. Uh, is one that uh, will outlast all of our careers and those of perhaps our granddaughters as well as uh, we continue to fight for ecosystems and river management and rivers. And so I'd like to uh, second to Malele's point, which is that this is not a discussion that we certainly could finish to get today and um, it is one that we should be taking up regularly uh, as, as we need. And um, I'm delighted by the fact that at this late hour, after such a full day of discussions, no one wants to leave the table, neither do I. So everyone should feel free to speak to one another. But I want to thank you all. I learned a tremendous amount from this discussion. I think it's extremely exciting, the range of research that's going on. I'm actually inspired and optimistic as a consequence of the deep level of thought and engagement that we see in this room. And uh, I look forward to everyone continuing to work uh, in this vein and together as much as we can. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All the presenters and. Uh...